Yo ho, yo ho, it's a pirate's life for me. <laughs> this is historically Zoe. <laughs> So last episode, we talked about how Jews set themselves up as a legitimate and really important part of the Jamaican economy. And now we're going to do the same for pirates. Ah, we got to the exciting part. Just kidding. I love all parts of my project equally. Piracy is often allowed because it is beneficial to the nations that sponsor it. Yeah. I said sponsor it. Nations are often really cool with pirates attacking their enemy ships because it gives them access to trade secrets, it's a form of spying, and it's a form of warfare. Piracy is often sanctioned through things called letters of mark. Letters of mark were letters that allowed sailors to outfit ships to capture other ships and do things that would generally be considered piracy, but instead the sponsoring country kind of takes the blame for it. Letters of Mark may have been issued to privateers and pirates in Jamaica as early as 1656. In the calendar of state papers that year, an entry reads, Warrant for letters of Mark against the Spaniards for Captain William Cook, master of the Hopewell and five other vessels named ready to sail with soldiers to Jamaica. That was recorded in the calendar of state papers and at Whitehall, the official record of colonial enterprises. That's a pretty legitimate acknowledgement of piracy happening in the Caribbean. Alongside licensing piracy, the English celebrated it. In a book published in 1672, Governor Thomas Lynch of Jamaica described the privateers of the island as... Privateers, hunters, sloop, and boatmen, which ply about the isle, at least 3,000 lusty and stout fighting men whose courage hath been sufficiently evidenced in their late exploit, an attempt made against the Spaniards at Panama. In this quote, not only does Governor Lynch describe the differences between the pirates of the island of Jamaica, but also references Henry Morgan, one of the most successful pirates of all time, and his attack and raid on Panama, which directly benefited the English in Jamaica. As the English licensed pirate ships to attack the Spanish at will, it also legitimized their reasoning to participate in trade. Without fear of legal retribution, Jamaica developed off of the profit from goods received, but they could gain valuable information about the surrounding colonial powers and also gain valuable resources. And furthermore, the English acknowledged that privateering was a vital resource to Jamaica and that the pirates weren't going anywhere despite whatever legal retribution they faced. In 1666, a record in the calendar of state papers stated, reasons why the private men of war are advantageous to the island of Jamaica and how the discountenancing of them ha already hath and will also for the future prove prejudicial to the settlement of that island. Captains David Martin and Moran and the diverse of the English privateers on the news that the commissions against the Spaniards were called in resolved never to return to Jamaica unless a war, but daily prey upon the Spaniards from Tortuga. Two of His Majesty's nimble fifth-rate frigates would do manifest service in commanding the privateers on all occasions to their obedience, making discovery of any enemy's actions and, the guard and guarding the coast from rovers. There is no profitable employment for the privateers in the West Indies against the French and Dutch, and being a people that will not be brought to planting will prey on the Spaniard whether countenanced at Jamaica or not. If his majesty allows two or three of his fifth-rate frigates for that service, such men should be appointed commanders as are experienced in affairs there, and of good parts and conduct that the privateers may the more willingly go on any design with them. The record states that attempting to dissuade piracy is just going to make piracy go elsewhere and allow a different island to receive the benefits of that trade. By allowing Port Royal to develop as a center for pirate trade, it encouraged more and more merchants to move there and on and on the cycle went until Jamaica was a flourishing settlement. A strong economy developed exporting illegally acquired goods. And this is evidenced by a quote from Governor Thomas Lynch, who said in 1671 that less than a quarter of what was shipped from the island was grown there. Privateers imported illegally acquired slaves, sugar, indigo, timber, and minerals. 
and then traded them with the merchants of the island who then exported those goods. This import and export of pirated goods allowed a thriving mercantilist society to develop regardless of the illegality of it. Pirates also contributed Jamaica not just through the cargo that they brought to its shores, but by sheer buying and spending power. They would spend vast amounts of money while in port. One account from Dutch buccaneer John Esquimeling states, such of these pirates are found who will spend 3,000 pieces of eight in one night. I saw one give a common strumpet 500 pieces of eight, only that he might see her naked. My own master would buy on the like occasion a whole pipe of wine and placing it in the street would force everyone to drink with him, threatening also to pistol them in case they would not. At other times, he would throw these liquors about the streets and wet the clothes of such as walked by without regarding whether he spoiled their apparel or not, were they men or women. Regardless of the morality of these wild, rambunctious men, their buying and spending power had to have an effect on the economy. 3,000 pieces of eight spent in a tavern or a brothel, as is just as likely, could lead the owner of that tavern or brothel to invest his new wealth in land, in stock, in store, in goods, in trade, and on and on and on. This developed Port Royal into an economic powerhouse that eventually became the most prosperous port city in the Caribbean. In a decade, Port Royal became the busiest port in the West Indies. In 1660, Port Royal saw only 20 merchant ships a year. A decade later, they saw 100 merchant ships a year. In 1668, there were 800 houses in Port Royal where there were only 500 in New Amsterdam. Port Royal had more brothels and more taverns than any other West Indy colony combined. It had a governor's mansion, churches built in both the English and Spanish style, and a synagogue where the majority of the Jewish population of the island practiced. Jews were just as vital to the economic development of Port Royal as pirates were, and together they created a thriving mercantilist society that was a result of their relationship. But we'll get into all of that next time. That's it for this episode of Historically Zoe. Again, my name is Zoe Katz. This video series is part of Agnes Scott College's History 440 Directed Research course and is under the advisement of Associate Professor of History, Robin Morris. To learn more about this series, you can visit piratejews.zoecats.agnescott.org or follow me on Twitter at historicallyzoe. Thanks so much and see you next time.